Thank you very much for coming to the conference. As an organizer of the conference, um, I, have, um, I really thank uh, all the people who are coming to this conference um, uh, on this uh, very uh, interesting topic. Um, I am uh, Hiroki Takeuchi. I am a um, uh, professor at political science department um, at the SMU and also fellow of the Tower Center for Political Studies. Um, before starting the panel, I'd like to thank um, uh, the staffs of the Tower Center. Um, uh, without the staff, we cannot do anything. Um, we are having more events this semester uh, than ever, um, and uh, it, would ha it would not be possible uh, without the staff. So I would like to uh, thank um, uh, Luisa De Rosal and uh, um, um, Jiyun Pyun and Mariko Isozaki. Um, our Tower Center is... <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you. So um, now uh, we are moving uh, to um, uh, the, our uh, today's panel. Um, it's panel two about the politics, uh, which is a very uh, peaceful uh, topic without any controversy. Um, so um, well, we have three panels and uh, three presenters, and we are going a little bit differently from um, conventional way of um, uh, of, pa uh, of panel. Um, I. I'm a moderator, and uh, I am also a discussant, but I'm more a uh, moderator than a uh, discussant. So uh, I start um, the discussion um, with um, uh, setting, some, uh, setting the tone of the uh, discussion uh, in this panel. And then um, I will introduce three panelists. And then after the presentations, uh, I will not comment on their presentations, but um, you can comment on their um, uh, presentations. Um, so. From the yesterday's um, Secretary Steinberg's um, presentation, uh, the keynote speech at dinner, um, which I enjoyed a lot and very informative, um, I would say uh, three things. Uh, I, I would throw in three things for uh, the kickoff of the discussion. So, and the which is highly related to uh, the three presentations um, you will uh, listen to um, soon. So the first thing is, well, the question of ch how, what threat China is facing. Um, we often talk about whether China is a threat, but at the same time, we often forget asking what kind of threat China is facing. A few years ago, my, question, my, uh, my student asked me, what is the country that uh, China is, uh, what, can, uh, what is the country uh, China takes as a threat that China is facing? My answer is, it is China. China is worried about the threat from the domestic sphere. Uh, it, is, um, it is shown in the fact that now China is spending more for police than the national defense. Um, Chinese local government buildings are burned by the Chinese people who are protesting against the government. No foreign government has burned any foreign gov uh, government building in China for, since the establishment of the PRC. So, th th so the first question is China is very vulnerable to the domestic, um, domestic, um, so, uh, domestic society, which makes China quite weak and vulnerable in the international sphere. Um, recently published a very well-received book written by Andrew Nathan and Andrew Scobell about China's foreign policy titled Search for Security. Uh, they conclude that what we have to worry about is not China being too strong, but China being too weak. What they mean with China being too weak is, uh, this is, that is the second point, uh, that's the third point that I, I, I would like to relate to, that is China is not strong enough to be a really a responsible state in the international sphere. And then for him, uh, for them, uh, the interna uh, the being responsible in the international sphere means providing international public goods that the United States has been providing since the World War II. So, so the three things I want to throw in, one, it seems that China is facing a threat from the domestic sphere. Second, 
China, whether China is strong enough to, um, to provide um, international public goods. And the third, it seems that China is not, does not have capacity or intention to provide what is called international public goods. And then today's three presentations all related, uh, relate to um, those three points. So uh, I've now, uh, looked, um, I would like to um, introduce uh, three panelists. I would like to go uh, one panelist, uh, one, um, each, uh, I would like to introduce each panelist and then followed by uh, presentation and then I would um, introduce another panelist. And then when I introduce the panelists, I would like to uh, introduce briefly uh, what they will talk about, so um, and so that then I would not, not have to um, comment on the each uh, this um, each um, presentation. The first presenter is um, Professor Peter Hayes Grace, um, longtime friend, and um, personally, uh, Peter is the one who called me, for, uh, first one who called me when I came to the United States for the first time to study at Berkeley in 1996. Uh, he received a Ber uh, PhD from the Ber uh, University of California at Berkeley, a PhD of political science. His first book is about the Chinese nationalism, China's, titled China's New Nationalism, and he's talking about how China's new, uh, nationalism influences the policy making of China. Um, as a political psychologist, um, he, um, he is writing the second book, um, currently uh, soon to be published, uh, the title, The Politics of American Foreign Policy. So now he shifts his focus from Chinese nationalism into how um, ideology forms the American foreign policy. So um, please join me for um, welcoming uh, Professor uh, Peter Gries on the podium. Thank you, Hiroki, and uh, I'd like to thank Jim and the Tower Center uh, for organizing this event and for including me. Um, I guess uh, I was just thinking as Hiroki was introducing me that I haven't yet thanked uh, Kokubun Sensei because with uh, Kokubun Sensei was, was my teacher briefly uh, at Keio uh, in Tokyo when I was studying Japanese there many moons ago. Um, but without Kokubun Sensei, I don't think I, I may not have met uh, Hiroki. So that's something I, I owe a, a thanks to, to Kokubun Sensei for introducing uh, the two of us quite a while ago uh, in California. Um, so today I'm going to kick things off um, with a discussion precisely of um, Hiroki has sort of <coughs> summed it up uh, very well with his first point. Uh, the argument I'm going to be making is that you cannot understand China's behavior in the Diaoyu Islands last year um, unless you look at it from the inside out, unless you understand the domestic politics. Um, I'm not going to go through all the history. You've heard some of it already. Um, Admiral uh, Walsh mentioned uh, the, the role of the Tokyo mayor, uh, responses to that. Then the Japanese government says, let's purchase the um, the islands, get it out of the hands of this nationalist and diffuse the situation. Instead, it actually makes things worse. Um, and you have just a huge mess in 2012. I wanted to give you a little bit of a feel for the mess. Um, this is uh, an example of the kinds of rhetoric that was displayed on the streets of China last year, um, just translating the, the beginning of this banner in front of, uh, looks like an Audi dealership. Um, even if China is covered in graves, we must still kill all Japanese. Um, and this is not unusual. Similar kinds of stuff appearing in Chinese cyberspace. Um, and I want to point to the one in the middle. The translation that I've made for that is, without killing Japanese, I cannot relieve the hatred in my heart. Uh, I guess thinking about what we've heard so far this morning and last night, um, I will say there is one, whoops, there's one phrase that's been sort of conspicuous in its absence, which is we've talked a lot about sovereignty, uh, but we haven't talked about sovereignty as subjectivity. And I guess that's also a, a part of the direction I want to point in, in my comments today, which is sovereignty is not just about territory. Sovereignty is also about identity. 
And specifically, if we think about the sort of metaphor of uh, the body politic, um, that's how we think about our nations, right? The map, the territory becomes symbolic of, of who we are. So, you know, losing an inch of territory is symbolic to cutting off your, your finger. Except potentially even more fundamental, because it's sort of like um, all hands on deck. You know, it's not just the hand. It represents the entire person. Um, so these disputes are zero sum, not just for material reasons, but for psychological reasons. They have to do with subjectivity. And there's, on the Chinese side, I want to give you an impression of the kinds of emotions that are implicated in this dispute. And it stems from the century of humiliation and Chinese narratives of victimization at the hands of the Japanese. Um, just to, to recall last night, there was a question about Taiwan and pointing out that Taiwanese also dispute Japanese sovereignty. Huge difference, though. Taiwanese do not share the same narrative of the century of humiliation, Japanese victimization. In fact, Taiwanese feel very positively towards Japan. In a survey that I did a couple years ago, only Singapore rivals Japan in warmth in Taiwan. So very, very positive. Whereas in surveys I've done in China, Japan is at the very bottom with Vietnam. So there's just polar opposites in terms of, of Taiwanese versus mainland Chinese attitudes towards Taiwan. Um, and these have to do with very different historical narratives. Uh, they have to do with the issue of subjectivity and identity. Um, more rhetoric from the streets, uh, Japanese and dogs may not enter. This has a historical referent I don't have time to get into right now. Um, some images from the protests that occurred uh, just about a year ago. Um, note the Mao poster, and I'm going to return to this later, but this is a fairly new image from last year. You didn't see a lot of that in earlier nationalist protests in China. It's kind of a new thing, and I think it's symbolic of, of what's going on uh, very fundamentally at the domestic level. To sort of um, preview, this is being shown to the Chinese government. It's not showing Mao to show the Japanese. This is about the domestic politics of state legitimation. And I'll, I'll, I'll end there, but that's a little preview. Here's another, you know, Sha Guang Ren at the end of the, the uh, banner there. Marchers. Um, the, the common symbol at the top right there about let's boycott Japanese products. Um, even change purses, so you know, people trying to hawk things, you know, they think they'll be more likely to hawk their little <laughs> couple penny change purse if they stick a, you know, the Diaoyu Islands are ours. So there is a commercial aspect. It's not that nationalism is purely an identity. Emo I mean, identities can be exploited, right? Uh, people buy. Uh, Dallas Cowboys shirts and wear them as part of their expressive identifying who they are. So someone may decide they want to buy this particular change purse um, to, to exhibit their, their patriotism. Um, kill the Japanese dogs. You know, on, at one level it's kind of funny. Um, if you've read John Dower, historian of Japan, on his work on World War II, um, this is also very chilling, because this is literally dehumanization. And I think there are compelling arguments to be made that you cannot have mass slaughter of fellow human beings when you see them as fellow human beings. We saw this in the Pacific War, where Japanese and Americans thought about each other as monkeys and devils, um, and we really had a brutal Pacific War. Um, that's why this kind of thing makes me very nervous. Um, so who cares? Recent scholarship, believe it or not, and I'll go through this fairly quickly, suggests that we shouldn't. And I think that this scholarship is, is misguided, frankly. Um, there's been a book out recently called Strong Society, Smart State that claims that the government is smart, is able to rationally manage Chinese nationalists. Uh, more recently, uh, a top uh, political science journal, International Organization, published an article which essentially argued the opposite of what Hiroki and I 
um, Hiroki just argued and I'm currently arguing, but that it's not about domestic politics, that it's really about bargaining theory. It's about um, a kind of audience cost in an authoritarian context. To me, this kind of uh, argument is, is not particularly persuasive. Um, the idea that somehow the government is in total control of the domestic scene and it simply allows or doesn't allow protests based on the kinds of signals it wants to send to Japan. Um, it's a kind of nice rationalist theory and it can get published in, in good journals because it's a theory that you know, has a pedigree in political science, but to me this kind of scholarship is dangerous because it can contribute to complacency. Um, I want to argue that actually popular nationalism does shape China's Japan policy. Um, it does appear that there is circumstantial evidence that is compelling that shows that China's Japan policy actually responded to popular nationalist demands. Now we can't get inside the minds of China's foreign policy decision makers. So there's no slam dunk evidence on this, but, but what I want to suggest is that there is circumstantial evidence in terms of sequence, right? The most basic requirement of causality is that a cause precedes an effect, right? And I think you can trace across 2012 an escalation of rhetoric being followed by an escalation of policy. Um, and why is that? So why does the regime respond? I mean, this is a difficult argument to make. China, they don't vote in China. This argument has been made in the United States that you know, there's an electoral connection. Why do our leaders care about American opinion on Syria or any foreign policy issue? It's because we'll vote the bums out if they take our policy in a different direction. That's the core of the argument in the American context, is that voting is what leads, what connects public opinion and foreign policy. So how does that work in China, where there's no voting? I want to argue that, essentially, that because there's no voting, the Chinese government does not have the procedural legitimacy that leads Americans to follow, say, George Bush into war, even when we don't agree. We say, OK, I disagree with your decision, but you were voted in. You have a certain amount of procedural legitimacy. Therefore, I will essentially allow this to happen. I'll consent to your, your policy choice. Ironically, in China, because they don't have that procedural legitimacy, they become more dependent on their other sources of claims to legitimacy. And the argument I'm going to make is that nationalism has been core to Chinese Communist Party claims to legitimacy ever since uh, the 1940s. Um, and that because of that, they're very much um, sort of tied to nationalist public opinion. Uh, this is just a kind of visual representation of some of uh, what happened in 2012. And uh, Kokubun Sensei may be able to give us more details uh, at lunch today. Um, but just very briefly, you know, my uh, quick analysis of 2012, and it hasn't been followed up into 2013, is that you really did see a dramatic escalation in terms of what the Chinese uh, government did, both in the water and in the airs over the disputed Diaoyu Senkaku area. And I believe that that was a response to the nationalist uh, outrage. And again, this is the argument. What is Mao known for saying in 1949? It's not a communist claim to authority. It's not workers of the world unite. He's known for saying China has stood up. That's a nationalist claim to authority. The Chinese Communist Party has staked its claim to legitimacy ever since its founding on the basis of saying, we defeated the Japanese, we're going to make China strong again. And of course, the other bases of authority, I mean, communism was part of the, the ideological claim, have now been delegitimized. The Chinese Communist Party no longer claims you should let us rule because we're communist. It's really only communism in name only. The Cultural Revolution just basically killed any belief in communism in China. And if that wasn't enough, the Tiananmen Square, I think, pretty much ended it. So to understand the Chinese Communist Party's rule today, think about it as a one-party dictatorship, not as a, a, a communist regime. 
So could it be that the Chinese Communist Party is actually more reliant upon its nationalist credentials today? And again, here's the argument I laid out earlier. Lacking the procedural legitimacy that democratically elected governments have, facing the collapse of communist ideology, the party it becomes increasingly dependent upon its nationalist credentials to rule. So it becomes hyper-attuned to the nationalist opinion I was showing you at the beginning of the talk. And this then provides rooms for popular nationalist counterclaims, often employing the very language of the state back against itself. So the popular nationalists can essentially, you could argue that in Chinese cyberspace, anti-Japanese nationalism is the most democratic space. Anything goes, freedom of speech, because the government would pay a high price if it tried to, to crack down. Um, and I think this picture really captures uh, the, the point succinctly in the sense that, you know, what you see here is nationalist protesters in conflict with Chinese police. And so this is the domestic politics of the foreign policy issue of anti-Japanese sentiment. Um, and you see evidence of this online last year, anger is directed not just at Japan, but also at China. So this, uh, this sentence I've translated as, China will la launch the strongest counterattack, very sorry, very severe condemnation, a kind of sarcasm in cyberspace that's incredibly potent. And you can bet, I believe, that the Chinese government is paying very careful attention to this, that the Chinese people are demanding tougher actions towards Japan. And I guess maybe this is the place uh, I return to this point. These posters are about expressive politics. It is like wearing the, the cowboy's jersey. It's about saying, I'm a nationalist. But I think it's also about saying, this is our patron saint. And you can't come in here and repress us like you repress a Falun Gong demonstration. Because this is about nationalism and you're claiming your legitimacy based on nationalism, therefore we have the right to contest that claim. Uh, this is a little bit crude, but it actually does, um, my grad student found this, um, I probably shouldn't have shown that, but it does, <laughs> forget the finger, but the point is America is in the middle. We can stick our heads in the sand you know, and be an ostrich and pretend this is a problem between China and Japan, but this is a very serious issue. And I was very grateful for Admiral Walsh's uh, opening this morning to, to set that context for us. Um, in fact, I might even go a step farther and make a prediction that if we have another conflict between the United States and China, in the short to medium term, the, more, the most likely scenario is not the kinds of stuff that materialist IR scholars talk about, the balance of economic or military power between the United States and China, power transitions. No, that's not going to be what leads to another conflict. If we have another conflict, it's going to come about because we get drawn into another issue like Sino-Japanese conflict or possibly a conflict between Taipei and Beijing over the status of Taiwan. The, the most likely scenario for America fighting China, in my view, is us getting sucked into a conflict between China and one of its neighbors. And I think Japan is probably the top candidate for that. Therefore, we should be t paying a lot of attention to this issue. Thank you. No one could uh, provide international public goods. And we should remember that this morning, uh, we, had, we started this history panel. Historically, in East Asia, there is no time period when balance of power brings stability. Always some big state, powerful state, provides stability. So um, now I'm going to uh, introduce next speaker, um, Professor uh, Dan Lynch. Um, Long-time friend since I went to UCLA. Um, uh, Professor Lynch is teaching um, at the um, University of Southern California, uh, the football library, um, with the UCLA, where I, I did uh, my PhD. Um, and uh, when I was organizing this conference, and I was thinking about who I would like to invite, and then Dan 
Dan's name comes up to my mind uh, immediately uh, because I was looking for somebody who can give an informative and provocative talk. Um, <laughs> what is, we have to sit at the same table at the association. <laughs> 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 Professor Lynch, the first book is about uh, um, after the propaganda state, uh, and then talking about now during the Maoist period, propaganda is the way of policy making. Now uh, China needs more institutionalized policy making, and that's what um, uh, that's the book that he wrote, uh, his first book. And then second book, um, which I really enjoyed, was the, uh, the rise of China and uh, uh, democratization in Asia. And then he has been working on Taiwanese politics for a long time. And as you know, Taiwan has democratized. And then um, so he looked at an, uh, the state of the democratization in Asia through the lens of the Taiwanese democratization. And then he's currently writing a book about uh, the, um, the elite perception, China's elite perception of the world and the international relations. That is a very timely topic because now President Xi Jinping is talking about China dream and then uh, uh, the, uh, the restoration of the Chinese, uh, Chinese nation, uh, which we do not know what it means. Uh, but um, uh, so Professor Lynch is writing um, the book and then that will answer some of the, those questions. So please uh, join me for welcoming, uh, welcoming Professor Lynch. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. I really appreciate it. I've had a great time here just hearing all the different perspectives and uh, historians, political scientists, a variety of stuff. It's really wonderful, the keynote speeches and so on. So hopefully I'll keep the level, you know, somewhat up to that, if not quite as high as that. Obviously, what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning is what really explains China's increasingly uh, assertive foreign policy, which I know, I mean, this has been in the news a lot in the last two or three years. So I know you know about it, but I'm going to give you a few examples of that first to illustrate what I'm talking about, and then put on the table, conclude really, with uh, what I hope will be a kind of provocative, counterintuitive interpretation of uh, what really explains China's increasingly assertive foreign policy since about 2009. And of course, I mean, we've heard uh, mostly uh, people, speakers, talk about the uh, territorial disputes in the East China Sea today. I'm going to mention that at a, 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 a point or two, but mostly concentrate on the South China Sea to give that a little bit more attention, just to illustrate the points that I'm going to make, although the increasing assertiveness obviously also applies to the East China Sea, the conflict with Japan. So indicators of increasing assertiveness. Let me just throw a few of these out at you. So he's, uh, Sam Zhao, he's a professor at the University of Denver. Here's a quotation from an article he wrote. China has grown increasingly vocal in protesting and pushing back U.S. naval operations uh, in international waters off its coast. We just heard Admiral Walsh this morning give a very good example of that. A group of Chinese vessels uh, intercepted an American surveillance ship in the South China Sea in March 2009. That's approximately when the increasing assertiveness begins. Although the American Navy had routinely deployed there to monitor Chinese military activities for years or decades. Uh, in February 2010, uh, State Department cables subsequently leaked through WikiLeaks, published by WikiLeaks, quoted U.S. Ambassador to China Huntsman, reporting that many leading figures in the foreign diplomatic community there in Beijing were becoming increasingly exasperated by what they perceived felt as China's newly pugnacious approach and the way they were dealing with treating uh, the foreign diplomatic community. At the July 2010 ASEAN forum, uh, uh, regional forum, Chinese Foreign Minister Yang Jiechi, during a tense discussion of the South China Sea uh, disputes, coldly reminded his ASEAN counterparts, especially looking the Singaporean representative right in the eye, uh, said, uh, you have to remember, China is a big country, and other countries are small countries, and that's a fact. <laughs> that's kind of cold, especially if you're a small country. In June 2012, the PRC upgraded a place called Sensha, uh, a tiny town on Yongxing Island in the Paracels. I'll show you a map here in just a second. From a county administrative office to a prefecture, prefecture with formal responsibility for administering all the land features and the water claimed by Beijing in the South China Sea. See the Paracel Islands up there? That's where uh, Sensha is now, this new prefecture. Uh, on Yongxing Island, up there in the Paracels, which uh, China invaded and took from South Vietnamese forces in January 1974, as control ever That is now effectively, uh, from China's perspective, the capital of the South China Sea. 
So the, administ the administrative center of everything China claims in the South China Sea. And you can see the great fanfare uh, that accompanied the establishment of this new prefecture. This was intentionally designed, I think, to be provocative. Right? You don't go through this fanfare, invite foreign media, establish a beautiful Soviet-style headquarters for this uh, new administrative uh, capital if you don't want to send a signal that you're, you're getting tougher. Okay? And then also in June 2012, uh, China outmaneuvered the Philippines in negotiations to end a two-month standoff over Scarborough Shoal, which we've heard mentioned a few times uh, since last night, Huangyan Island in Chinese. Initially, Beijing agreed to what later, it turned out, was an American proposal for both sides. There was a bit of standoff, you want to say, for both sides to withdraw their uh, uh, fisheries administration uh, vessels uh, to cool down tensions and end the standoff. Philippines complied. China then immediately reneged and sent even more vessels in and has occupied Scarborough Shoal ever since for two years. Recently, you may have read the news in the last couple of weeks, Philippines is complaining China is now starting to fortify the islets because there are 75 concrete blocks that have suddenly mysteriously appeared there. Philippines intends to go and remove those blocks. China is saying, A, we didn't put those blocks there. B, you better not remove those blocks. <laughs> Figure that out. So this is something, and these are just a few of many indicators that, that we could put on the table of China's increasing assertiveness in the last uh, few years. There you can see Scarborough Shoal. I mean, you've seen it on maps. Others have, uh, have presented before. OK, so the dominant explanation uh, given for this uh, increasing Chinese assertiveness is hubris felt by Chinese foreign and security policy-making elites since the global financial crisis. So here we have Sui Sheng Zhao again of Denver. Chinese leaders have become increasingly confident in the aftermath of the global financial crisis and their ability to deal with the West because the Chinese economy, superficially at least, rebounded quickly and strongly from the global downturn. Uh, confident in the balance of power, tipping in China's uh, favor, uh, Chinese leaders now believe China's gained more leverage and rights to forcefully safeguard Chinese interests rather than compromise on them. Okay. Others came to the similar conclusions in terms of hubris being the dominant explanation. Joseph Nye, the famous uh, professor, wrote about soft power, many other things, visited China in the spring of 2011. This is a little after Sam Zhao was writing. He reported that his interlocutors all acknowledged that there had been a shift to a tough, new, more assertive Chinese foreign policy. They they're not denying it in China. Uh, and they explained unapologetically that, hey, we were weak before 2008, but now we're strong, now that you, the United States, have begun your inevitable decline, which we've been predicting for 20 years. One of the analysts elaborated that after the financial crisis, many Chinese came to believe that we in China are rising, the U.S. is declining. Then uh, Michael Swain, senior Chinese analyst who actually in the past has been very sympathetic to the CCP and its foreign policy claims, came to uh, a similar conclusion in 2012, a year later still. He said, after visiting China and talking with a lot of people, many Chinese observers not only recognize that the Chinese government is becoming more influential and assertive, but regard such a, a development as entirely unsurprising. They calmly assert that China has marched to the center of the world stage and is more publicly emphasizing the defense of its core interests as part of a long-term process of development involving the gradual expansion of Beijing's global power and influence. And this kind of rings true. It's consistent with Xi Jinping's China Dream Discourse, because that also envisions a Chinese kind of, re kind of recentering of China in world history and global affairs. But there's a puzzle that has led me uh, in the last year or so, year or two really, to question this explanation of hubris explaining, explaining uh, the shift to the greater assertiveness. And the reason is, and this relates to the research that Hiroki talked about, this third book that hopefully is going to be finished really soon uh, that I'm writing, um, read a lot of Chinese economists analyzing China's economic strengths and difficulties between 2009 and 2013. In other words, precisely at the same time as the shift to a more assertive foreign policy. And I find almost universally, literally almost universally, Chinese economists are highly pessimistic 
about the state, the current state, and especially the near-term future state of China's economy, okay? Which seems inconsistent with feelings of hubris, right? Let me give you just a few, I mean, you, you read this in the newspapers all the time now. It, it, it did not appear in the, uh, in the English language business press until just the last couple of years, I think. Remember in 2009, 2010, even into 11, all the business press was praising China for its fabulously successful response to the global financial crisis, putting America to shame. Now that whole discourse has shifted, but the Chinese economists knew all along, going back to the mid-late 2000s, we're really not nearly as strong economically as we look. And let me just give you a few examples of that. Um, and these are really quotations from internal circulation only Chinese uh, economic documents that you can access at various libraries. You all know about the uh, uh, excessive reliance on investment uh, to stimulate GDP growth that China fell into in the last 20 years. You know, it stems from this uh, cozy relationship between state-owned banks, which provide uh, loans to state-owned enterprises, especially the hundred or so centrally controlled state-owned enterprises, and interest rates that are often below the rate of inflation, in other words, negative real interest rates, and that the state-owned enterprises don't ultimately have to pay back if they don't want to anyway. So there's just this constant flow of fun. And, and by the, of course, to do that, you have to keep interest rates artificially low for the hapless Chinese household savers. So there's a financial repression of families who would be consuming Chinese production. So to give loans at really low rates, sometimes below inflation, to Chinese state-owned enterprises. So um, you see this, yeah, Tan, this well-known economics journalist reporting that consumption as a percentage of GDP fell already from 46.4%, very low in 2000, to just 35% 2000. So what is it in the United States? 70%. I mean, this is unbelievably low. And, and what it means is an imbalance, fundamentally, between supply and demand. China has an overwhelmingly huge amount of productive capacity in almost every line of, a, of, of production you can imagine. And so it produces all kinds of stuff, but it has very weak capacity to absorb everything it produces. So what it did, of course, in the 2000s was rely on net exports increasing by 20, 25% a year to get rid of that excess production and keep employment relatively high. Well, you can't do that, obviously, so easily since the global financial crisis because all of China's big trading partners are in trouble. And actually, China's uh, net exports, its trade surplus, has leveled off in the last year. And so uh, the current structure of Chinese trade can maintain the current level of GDP, but can no longer increase GDP. That's what's the situation now. Uh, right, well, okay, I just, I just said it. No longer possible to do this, nor is continuing to increase investment possible to fuel GDP growth, because there's no more viable projects left. Right? The projects, especially after the massive stimulus program they put into effect in late 2008, 2009, which resulted in all kinds of crazy projects being invested in, these projects necessitated local governments taking out loans to put, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to put on track. Right? So these projects were built, put in place, and so on. A high speed rail, another local steel factory, new housing projects, golf course, everything you could imagine, new shopping malls. Are, they're not generating revenues sufficient to pay back the loans. So now what, there's just no more viable projects, really. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little. Many fewer viable projects to invest in. So this is no longer a, a, an option. Meanwhile, bad debts are accumulating because these projects that have been invested in in the past are not generating revenues sufficient to pay back the loans. Okay, so that's a problem. Shortages of natural resources, byproducts partly of excessive investment, especially by these inherently wasteful state-owned enterprises, eventually this will cause inflationary pressures to become endemic, right? As natural resources, uh, sure, obviously it cause prices to rise. That'll place hard limits, Chinese economists are worrying, on potential improvements in the average Chinese quality of life. Basically, let's say gasoline will just become so expensive that there's only so many cars per capita that would be pop privately owned automobiles per capita even be possible in China. And the same for a whole range of other natural resources. Uh, then, and in this vein, one writer castigates the entire Chinese growth model 
noting that even though GDP did increase 14-fold from 1949 through 2009, consumption of mineral resources increased 40-fold. Extremely wasteful, extremely inefficient. Obviously, this can only go on for so long. And then uh, serious environmental pollution. Some writers calculate that pollution and related environmental degradation destroyed 10% of GDP every year from 1987 through 2007. This is page one of why economists are not optimistic. Let me just give you a few more, because this is really key to my argument that I don't think it's hubris that can explain this shift to a more assertive foreign policy. I think it's got to be something else. Inequality. Just let me point out, not only is it a socio-political problem, but when you have massive inequality, you also can't make a, a shift to domestic consumption-led growth, GDP growth, away from investment or net exports, to domestic consumption-led GDP growth, because if the average household is, doesn't really have enough to buy detergent and so on, every you, you, there are television sets and so on, it's, it's not going to happen. You need a greater level of equality in order to be able to, mean, to manage a transition like that. The notorious housing real estate bubble, you know this really well. I, I'm not going to go into detail. Just point out that in 2009, uh, one al analyst calculated that 9.5 trillion yuan in new credit was issued in the year 2009. That's total amount issued in the previous four years, issued in one year. One analyst calculates that uh, only 4 trillion of this 9.5 trillion yuan new credit entered the, entered the property market, uh, that, that 4 trillion entered the property market, and at most only 2 trillion became GDP. So you see what I'm, so 2 trillion became GDP, meaning it actually went to productive uh, processes. 4 trillion was just used to bid up the price of property. So you had this huge flooding of the economy with new credit and new money most of which was used just to bid up the price of property, not increase real GDP. And, and that enters, interacts with inequality because it makes it hard for the average person to buy a home. And the final economic point, uh, 2010 census results, very disappointing to Chinese uh, economists and demographers because the population grew at a much slower rate, it turned out, in the first decade of uh, this century than expected. What it means is that if after adding 6 million uh, workers every year to the labor force in the two decades leading up to 2010, now, starting actually within just a couple of years, China will start seeing a decline in workers in the labor force of about 6.7 million. The labor force has already started to shrink. Then in the year 2026, according to current projections, the entire population will start to shrink. And India will surpass China to become the world's most populous country. So it's like Japan, only we, you know, we've all heard it'll be Japan, but China at a much, at a much poorer uh, level of capita economic development than Japan. So you know, this is not, again, this does not inspire uh, a lot of confidence, you would think, if you were a Chinese grand strategist. Yeah, we're about to surpass the United States and recenter ourselves in world history. It actually looks like they're going to be heading in the opposite direction and that the rise of China will slow and I could go on about what it would take to get out of this mess, this series of interconnected messes. Basically, what it's going to take is a sharp reduction in investment that would have to be sustained for several years while they make the shift to domestic consumption-led growth by increasing wages and so on. It's going to mean a recession. And then following that sharp recession, many years of lower growth, it could mean two lost decades like Japan. Because then, once the recession and the several years of slower growth finally possibly start coming to an end, then the demographic problem kicks in. And this is what all China, I mean, literally almost all Chinese economists are saying. Okay, so how could there be hubris? <laughs> right? Uh, there's two or three explanations. First, Chinese people aren't reading China's own economists. They don't know what's going on. And they're not reading the demographers. This may be true for the general public, because there was a, poll, a Pew poll published uh, last summer that found fully two-thirds of Chinese respondents from the general public think China will eventually supplant or already has supplanted the U.S. as the world's leading economic power. But that's the general public, and you know they're not told everything by the Chinese media about what they need to know. But not reading the economists or not being aware of these economic problems also seems true for elites. 
In the course of, of this book project, I've also read a lot of Chinese IR specialists, political scientists, and so on. And I found in, in this research that while some IR scholars are aware of the economist's critiques, even they will blithely dismiss the importance of these critiques. And sometimes during interviews, smile knowingly at the naive foreigner and with a wave of the hand, dismiss the critiques as not being of any possible importance whatsoever in the grand scheme of things, which is China's rise and recentering in world history. I mean, I actually had to, I, sometimes you get a little angry at being dismissed like that, but on the other hand, I knew this was gonna be great in the book, so I kept on writing and smiling. Still, even if the public and the IR academics don't read or take seriously the economists, how could the central leadership architects of the newly assertive foreign policy not be aware of the problems? Their statements make clear that they are actually aware of the problem. If you look at the statements of the previous premier, Wen Jiabao, who stepped on last, uh, last March, actually, and the current premier, Li Keqiang, they, over and over again in their public statements, make it clear they understand really well, thoroughly, the economic problems. Um, what even, uh, and, and, and even though these two, the premier, uh, former premier, current premier, probably don't directly play a role in uh, constructing the foreign policy strategy. That is, they probably don't sit in the weekly meetings of the leading small group on foreign affairs and security affairs. They answer directly to the party general secretary who chairs the Central Military Commission and chairs those meetings every week. So it seems implausible to me that the top leadership would not know, including in the PLA, would not know what's going on economically. So that leads, and this is where I'll, I'll conclude, that leads to an alternative explanation for the new assertiveness that I don't really know, I don't know if this is true or not. I'm just gonna throw this out there and see what you think and, and suggest we debate this and put this out there and see what we come up with. Fear and anxiety. The highest elites know fully aware, I think, that the days of the economic rise are numbered. I mean, we may be talking about just two or three more years of this. And they worry, consequently, about a window of opportunity closing. Right now, the world still views China with awe, especially in Southeast Asia, but in other parts of the world, too. The uh, top leaders of China, Li Keqiang Premier, the Xi Jinping, the party general secretary, probably also know that the necessary re economic reforms the reforms necessary to, to turn this ship around, the demographic, you'll never turn the demography around, that's too late. But the economic reforms are gonna be difficult or impossible to implement because of the opposition of very strong entrenched interests, uh, of not only of state-owned enterprises themselves, but of the interlocking families which now control them. It's gonna be difficult to uh, implement these uh, uh, reforms, so you better act now while China is still regarded by so many foreigners with awe, because five, 10 years from now, if China enters a period of first recession, then low growth, and that continues endlessly, what kind of prestige and awe are they gonna have? Now's the time to establish effective control over territories, which the security elites want for a variety of reasons. Admiral Walsh talked about needing to, the, thinking that they need to control everything inside the first island chain. Already, they've been talking about that for a couple of decades now. But probably also they, they would want, others in the elites would want to control the uh, maritime territories, in particular because of the potential that they uh, contain lots of natural gas or energy, energy as well as food resources, which are gonna be really important if they don't succeed in reforming the economy because the less successful they are at shifting to a truly market economy, a truly efficient economy, the more they're gonna need heavily subsidized energy and food supplies to take care of the population. So that's where I'll conclude. Just throwing that idea out there, is it not actually this fear of a window of opportunity closing rather than hubris that explains the shift to a more assertive Chinese foreign policy? Thank you. I think I have correctly warned that he's provocative. Um, <laughs> now uh, I introduce the third speaker uh, who has a very hard job that is giving us uh, an optimistic tone. Um, um, the, uh, the third speaker is uh, uh, Professor William Norris, um, teaching at the uh, Bush School uh, of Texas A&M University. Uh, 
he came um, to Texas a few years ago, and um, a huge addition uh, to the studies of Chinese politics uh, in Texas. Um, when we met for the first time, and then when he was coming to uh, Texas A&M, I said I was so happy, and then I said, uh, okay, so you're welcome to our neighborhood. And then he's, he's from a uh, uh, PhD uh, of um, um, MIT, and then his uh, friends from uh, MIT was wondering, just how close is it? And it's about a three-hour drive. And then I thought it was an uh, definition of the neighborhood, but uh, his friends from East Coast, which has, and if you drive for three hours and you encounter, you, you pass at 500 universities probably, um, that it, was not, it is not a uh, uh, neighborhood. Um, but anyway, uh, so he's working on uh, international relations but no, with China, but especially the interaction between security and economy, which is very important. And currently, uh, academia are very much uh, compartmentalized. Uh, so, um, and then security experts and the economy experts are not uh, uh, speaking with each other. But um, Professor Norris is uh, uh, working on both uh, security and economy and their interactions. So please welcome me, uh, please join me for welcoming Professor Norris. Uh, thank you very much, Hiroki. Um, and I, I, uh, I'm reminded of the analogy that says when you try to keep one foot on the dock and one foot in the boat, you'll end up falling in the water. So I, although I try to bridge these two worlds, uh, I'm often told by members of each of those worlds, you can't do that. Uh, you're not. Uh, so um, I just want to say thank you to Jim and, and Hiroki and uh, Diana for uh, bringing me in on, on this uh, conference. I think it's been a really terrific conference. Um, my comments, I think, are going to follow nicely with what both Peter and Dan uh, have already laid out. Um, I have a slightly different interpretation, I think, maybe than what Dan left us with, but I think it'll be interesting food for thought. Um, uh, so to get there, and I just want to make sure, how much time do we still have? How important is it to uh, stay on schedule here to 11.45? Because that gives me nine minutes. <laughs> no, no, we, we've got a little bit of questions. Okay, because I could do it at nine if you want me to, or I can actually take the 15. All right. All right. Um, so I'm going to look at uh, a series of recent events just to kind of bring everyone up to speed. And then I'm going to try to give you an interpretation as to why those might be happening. And that interpretation, I think, will dovetail nicely with what we've already heard uh, this afternoon, this morning. Um, and then I think I'm going to leave it with sort of a, an indication for the future and what we might expect going forward, because I think that's really what's at the heart of a lot of these conflicts. Um, and this is the panel on politics. So I sort of with much hesitation weighed into this historical uh, narrative. I'm always reminded of. Uh, of the, the bane of political science when we deal with historians is how much violence we do to, to the nuances of history. And we do ask these questions about why, because we care about why these things happen. Um, so uh, Peter was laying out this uh, popular response that's occurred domestically uh, in China to perceived Japanese aggression on some of these disputed territories. Uh, and this really does take off and heat up in, in 2012. And what I'm going to try to do is very quickly give you some high points of how I'll suggest China has begun to formalize some of these contestations in a way that they hadn't done previously. Previously, often from the Chinese side, it's been, oh, these are fishermen or, or passionate nationalists. But recently, I think, we've seen a change. And I think this change is a process of institutionalization and formalization that wasn't present previously in this dispute, um, particularly in Senkaku. So August is 14th of 2012, for the first time since 1996, seven Hong Kong activists actually disembark onto the islands in Senkakus. August 19th, 10 Japanese activists swim ashore and raise the Japanese flag. So uh, you'll see a pattern here. This is sort of the tit for tat and, and the, the ratcheting up these nationalization issues. September 10th, uh, the Japanese government actually announces, okay, we're going to nationalize the islands. We're going we're to avoid the potentially destabilizing effect. That's what Adam Walsh uh, alerted to uh, earlier. Uh, and Alexis mentioned this uh, this morning. On September 12th, we start hearing whispers that uh, in public, publicly available documents that Xi Jinping uh, has been in charge of a new maritime security leading small group. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Chinese domestic politics, leading small groups is kind of the interagency cooperation mechanisms by which you actually administer and govern China. Uh, these are the senior decision makers on given topics or issue areas or functional areas. Uh, and they bring them together on a fairly regular basis to make decisions at the highest levels of Chinese domestic politics. The fact that, number one, this has been created, and number two, at the time, the vice president or sort of the, uh, the, the leader in the wings was given the head of this leading small group, I think indicates some important changes that we might be seeing uh, in terms of this formalization that I'm going to lay out for you. 
Um, so September 14th, two days after the announcement of this, or this, this leak and the establishment that we're going to be reorganizing the state oceanic agency, the administration that's in charge of uh, these multiple players um, that, that are involved in some of these maritime territorial disputes. So two days later, six Chinese maritime surveillance ships go into the Diaoyu Islands uh, as a law enforcement effort. Uh, they leave after seven hours. September 15th, the next day, you get these big anti-Japanese protests that start. And this is really uh, what Peter gave us a really nice uh, set of visuals on that. Um, September 17th, Toyota and Honda temporarily shut down their manufacturing facilities in the mainland. Um, and on September 25th, uh, you have the Taiwanese getting involved. So this is when the Taiwanese fishing vessel gets escorted by the Coast Guard. You have the water cannon duel going on. Um, Finally, the mainland authorities break up some of the protests at the end of September, September 29th, and start saying, okay, enough is enough. We've had about two weeks of these fairly escalated anti-Japanese uh, demonstrations, publicly speaking. Uh, by October, Chinese, uh, Japanese auto manufacturing on the mainland is down about 50% from before the crisis occurs. Now, this, I raise this because this is unusual. Generally speaking, if you look at the data of the previous conflicts in 90, 96, 2004, 2005, and you, look, you overlay it with the trade relationship, and I'll sort of end the talk on this economic dimension, there's no real impact. This is all cheap talk. It doesn't really affect the trading relationship between the two parties. And at the end of the day, they're not going to go to war with each other because you have this interdependence and both sides count on each other too much. So don't worry about it. It's just cheap talk. Um, this time around, it seems like there is a little bit of cost. And I think I've been able to pinpoint most of that cost comes on the expense of Japanese exports to China. So it's a Japanese economic penalty that's being paid as a result of some of this behavior. Uh, October 25th, the, uh, the, the JDF uh, Air Forces release a statement saying that um, they've had to uh, scramble some of the planes over the last couple of weeks because Chinese planes have been skirting extremely close to the exclusive airspace. Uh, the surveillance ships uh, patrols continue from the end of October to the beginning of November. In December, uh, Japan scrambles fighter jets, jets again, this time explicitly in response to the Y-8 surveillance plane. Uh, that's, uh, that's detected, that's, that's an incursion into exclusive airspace. Uh, December 26th is when uh, Abe uh, Shinzo gets sworn in as the prime minister of Japan. Uh, when he comes in, a couple days later, he announces that he plans to increase the defense budget. He offers a proposal to the Diet and says, this year we're actually going to raise the defense budget by about 3%. That's different than what the defense budget had been doing for the last 11 years, where it's been fairly flat. Uh, as part of this proposal, there's a 13% increase in funding given to the Coast Guard explicitly to build new patrol ships, piers, and justified by, quote, the need to guard the waters around the disputed islands. So clearly, Abe is the new leader in Japan. He comes in with an idea about uh, these islands and these disputes. And I'll suggest that this idea is motivated in an instrumental fashion from a domestic political logic. Um, and I think that it makes sense from a domestic political logic for him. Uh, but I would suggest that the strategic international consequences of what appears to be rational domestic behavior, as Admiral Walsh suggests, um, doesn't bode well for future stability in this, in this particular relationship. January 10th, um, Japan scrambles an F-15 squadron, uh, seeing what it says are uh, J-7s and J-10s that are inside the air defense identification zone. Uh, this is in 2013 of this year. Uh, at, the, at the end of January, Xi Jinping uh, begins to make echoes of um, traditional Chinese suggestions of de-escalation of these kinds of disputes. He says, like the older generation of leaders, we should show a sense of national and historical responsibility and political wisdom, overcome the difficulties in bilateral relations, and push relations forward. He has this in conversation with uh, the Japanese special envoy uh, from the coalition government. February 6th, uh, Japan claims that uh, maritime security vessels had a radar weapons lock on the Japanese Coast Guard ship. Very provocative, very provocative action. Uh, China denies this three days later. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll hear more about some of these, uh, or I hope you hear more about some of these actions over the lunch. Uh, and in, uh, at the end of February, uh, Abe makes a, a public speech on defense saying, listen, the hostility levels are being raised. We have to take action on this. We can't just allow these things to go on uh, unchecked. Uh, on, Mid-March, uh, as part of the, um, the convening of sort of the state institutional handover to the Xi Jinping administration, uh, is announced a reorganization of a couple of ministries. And one of the important reorganizations, as far as we're concerned here at this conference, is the reorganization of the SOA, the State Oceanic uh, Administration. Uh, and this is uh, basically a rolling up of what had been 
fairly fractured uh, sub-state official government Chinese actors, each of whom had stakes in some of these territorial disputes. So the Ministry of Fisheries, um, you had some of these maritime surveillance uh, organizations, the Coast Guard. Uh, and so they've sort of uh, rationalized this and consolidated this. This follows a pattern in Chinese domestic politics of getting control of an industry or getting control of a particular sectoral dynamic by uh, rolling it up. You want to consolidate it, centralize it, and put someone in charge of it that you can count on to execute what you want to have happen in the, in the political sense. Um, this summer, the end of July, July 27th, uh, 2013, once again, uh, a Y-8 surveillance craft uh, flies between Okinawa and Miyaku uh, uh, Islands. And on August 1st, um, there's a uh, Xi Jinping, and this I think is important, Xi Jinping actually directly quotes Deng Xiaoping's uh, position on, on this dispute, dating back to the 1978-79 timeframe. Uh, and he talks about emphasizing the shelving of disputes, focus on economic development, we should let, leave this for a future generation that's going to be smarter than us. Um, I'll tell you why I think that's important and the timing of this matters. Uh, August 8th, uh, you've got three, Jap uh, three Chinese Coast Guard vessels that enter in the 12-mile nautical zone, joined by a fourth. They leave after 28 hours from the initial sortie. So you're seeing more extensive patrols, more, more ships involved in the patrols, lingering for longer time periods. I would suggest, to Dan's point, this is China trying to establish uh, something that they have not done a very good job in so far, which is a contested administration of these, of these disputed territories. And according to international law, right now the de facto situation is that Japan administers these, these islands. So if, Japan, if China wants to change that status quo, one of the things they have to do is sort of establish a presence in the area. And I think this is what they're trying to do with these, with these patrols. Um, the exports to China uh, fall to the lowest level in four years uh, at the end of the summer uh, from Japan. Uh, the bilateral trade relations go down in the first half of this year by 8.8% uh, in, a, in a way that um, I think reflects some of these tensions, particularly what Peter was highlighting, which is the popular displeasure toward Japan. So the, the boycotts, the, the explicit uh, marginalization of Japanese products to the Chinese consumer. So these, these are, are not finding a, uh, a receptive market uh, in China. Uh, and then on September 9th, so about 10 days ago, uh, the Japanese SDF scrambled jets uh, in response to what's described as a drone aircraft, uh, either in or near uh, Japanese airspace. And I wasn't able to pin down exactly whether it violated the airspace or not. Um, and then uh, September 14th, once again, you have four Chinese Coast Guard vessels patrolling waters uh, around the Senkakus. So all told, in the last 12 months, the Chinese SOA, so the Chinese administration in charge of these provocative actions, reports 60 Chinese patrols into these, uh, into these disputed waters, <clears throat> and they're publicizing this. This is not something they're trying to hide. Once again, why would you publicize this? Well, because you want to establish a track record that the administration of these disputed territories is under dispute, something that Japan has not yet uh, agreed to. Um, the Japanese SDF confirmed this, and they, sort of, they report that, on average, between the beginning of July to the beginning of September, there's a airspace or maritime incident on average every three days during this time period. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, they don't all involve clear-cut violations of the claimed territorial zones, but China is lighting up Japan's defenses. They're probing, they're testing, they're trying to see, oh, if we do this, what do they do? If we go here, what do they do? If we send this many, who do they send? They're, this is the classic sort of probing of a, of a uh, resolve. So why do you see this? Why do you see this kind of uh, behavior? This is Admiral Walsh's very good question. Why does this happen? Um, I think uh, I would suggest that it's, it's domestic political rationales. And I'm going to walk you through two stories. Uh, and again, they're only stories. This is all very uh, circumstantial and circumspect. We don't have very good data on how China makes its senior decision making. Um, someday, maybe we will. Right now, we don't. Uh, what we can observe are some behavioral aspects of it. And we can draw on what we understand and what we know about from previous behaviors to, to have some suggestions about why this is happening now. So I looked at this in terms of who wins and who loses in the domestic scenes on both sides. So in Japan, who wins from having escalation? Well, clearly, Abe shores up his national space. He comes into the uh, premiership, <clears throat> to the prime ministership, with an agenda to revise the national constitution, to revise Article 9, to make Japan a normal state. He also <clears throat> wouldn't mind uh, improving the defense budget a little bit. So this serves both of those, both of those domestic political goals, and this is a perspective that he has. Um, 
So I think that that makes sense for where he is in the domestic Japanese political scene. Uh, and I think that, um, that this fits a domestic Japanese political logic. Japan has the de facto administrative burden. China often signals its desire to damp this down, to, to ratchet down tensions. And I think when it does that, it provides Japan with the sense that they can control the escalation. They can turn up the heat on this, on this situation, and they can turn it down, because they're the ones that have the initiative, is the sense I, I'm sensing from the Japanese domestic political scene. And so they feel comfortable playing this card to achieve the other priorities from a domestic political scene. On the Chinese side of the equation, who wins and who loses from escalation? Uh, I think this is a little bit more complicated. Um, clearly, the Chinese uh, anti-Japanese sentiment, the hardliners, those are going to be the ones that are going to be winning. Uh, but is Xi Jinping, and this is one of the things that, that we're sort of, in the US, we're sort of trying to scratch our heads about, is he really a hardliner? Is he really a nationalist? Uh, I don't think we have a lot of evidence yet that suggests that that's definitively the case in what we're dealing with here. I'll suggest a little different conclusion to the same data that Dan presented just recently. I think what's going on is I don't think necessarily that the Chinese leadership has given up on the idea of economic reform. I think it is a daunting task. I think they understand it's going to be a daunting task. But I think that they still believe that they can do this. And I think Xi Jinping shows up with Li Keqiang, and he says, we need to set the stage for what is going to be a heavy lift. This is not going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of resistance. And Xi Jinping looks at explicitly Deng Xiaoping in 78 and the relationship between China and Japan in the 78 situation, where they're signing the Treaty of Friendship between China and Japan. There's uh, a movement in the Japanese diet to uh, undercut this, this effort. They say, well, let's, we need to resolve the Senkakus before we sign this treaty. Who leads that movement? Do you guys know? Abe's father is, the, is the, the parliamentarian who says, this is what we should do before we sign on board with China. Eventually, they sort of say, no, 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 that really doesn't make any sense. And Deng's idea of, we'll table this now, we'll move on and, and move to other things. So they are able to eventually overcome this, uh, this inertia. So Xi Jinping says, OK, well, how does Deng do this? And you have to imagine, and this is where I think the, the historical parallel and analogy has some traction. Deng Xiaoping in 1978 has just completed his initial consolidation after the death of Mao. Deng Xiaoping knows, although this, this dust up with Japan happens in April of 1978, mid-April 1978. Deng Xiaoping in December of 1978 gives a very famous speech where he announces the launching of this opening up and reform effort, Gaga Kaifeng. That speech is in December 1978. Deng knows what he's about to do. He knows that he's about to radically transform China's economic development situation. He also knows that to do that effectively, he needs to marginalize the hardliners. He needs to complete his consolidation of the grasp of, of power that he has over Hua Guofeng, because he's still sort of cleaning up the mess that, that happens in the wake of, of Mao's passing. So Deng is setting the stage for what he's anticipating is going to be a very difficult and potentially domestically uh, friction-filled endeavor. And I would suggest that Xi Jinping is very consciously potentially doing the same thing. So is he interested in doing this kind of reform? I don't know. We'll find out. I mean, this is, this is a hypothesis. Uh, it's going to be a heavy lift. And I'm not sure he's going to be successful at it. But I think it, it, bears, uh, it bears thinking about. And I think there's some suggestions that Xi Jinping has thought that, this might, uh, that something big might be coming down the pipe. This World Bank and State Council study that came out last year, uh, this is jointly sponsored by the World Bank and the Chinese State Council. <laughs> Uh, who's in charge of state council at that point? It's Li Keqiang, the guy who's going to become the guy in charge of the economic reform movement. If you look at this report, and it's thick, and I, I look at it, it's like 350 pages, uh, it's all about we need to reform the institutions, we need to really move forward, this reform process has stalled out in China, we need to kickstart it and move forward. Clearly, uh, this is leaked or, or, or publicized as a way to sort of prep the battle space. The military would say you have to prep the battle space. Uh, that's, and I would suggest that rather than, I think it is fear, I think it is anxiety, but I think it's designed to preempt a domestic hardliner backlash to what Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang are anticipating may be uh, a, heavy, a heavy move forward to restart this economic reform process. And I'm not sure it's going to be successful or not. And I don't know that um, at this stage it matters. I think what matters is that they are going to give it a try. Uh, and so we'll see. This corruption campaign, another thing that I always 
tell my students, when you study China and you see corruption, you see people getting knocked down for corruption, well, I mean, it's almost hardly ever because they're immoral. <laughs> it's hardly ever because they did something bad. It's generally because somebody annoyed someone and they didn't have the political cover above them to protect them anymore. So look at who's going down in the corruption stuff. It tends to be those individuals that might potentially get in the way of a significant economic reform agenda. So they're hardliners, they're Maoist populists, Bo Xi Lai's, Zhou Yong Kong. You've got uh, these individuals, um, uh, John, uh, Zhang Jiemin, so the person who's in charge of SASAC, so the individual who might potentially, if you want to reform the state-owned enterprises, you probably want to make sure that the individual who's in charge of the state-owned enterprise administration bureau is on board with your reforms. Well, inconveniently, this individual is a protege of Zhou Yongkong, who is known as being a resistor or a hardliner or someone who's interested in potentially um, causing problems or at least being hard to dance with uh, from, a, from a Politburo standpoint to uh, Xi Jinping and the Li Keqiang agenda. Uh, so we investigate him. We say, oh, you were in charge of uh, CMPC during some times when there were some improprieties. And sure enough, you see this publicly and, and down he goes. Uh, and so, again, these are just data points. I don't know for sure. I have no smoking gun. All I see is data, and I can sit back and know what I know about Chinese domestic politics and sort of try to connect the dots. And I would suggest that something look, so if I'm correct, one of the things you could look for, and this is one of the things that's very dangerous. Professors are never supposed to do this, but I don't care. Uh, so one of the things I think you should do as a professor is you should have work that speaks to the real world. If this hypothesis is actually true, this hypothesis I put out there that says maybe there's an agenda going on here that's domestically motivated, that has these international security implications with the relationship between Japan and China. But if this is true, then sometime in the next 18 to 24 months, we should see an effort on the part of China's leadership to really move forward on this economic reform agenda. I don't know if it's gonna work or not. That's not part of my story. Part of my story is that there's an agenda that's out there and that that agenda is gonna face resistance and it'll face less resistance as a result of this preemptive cleaning of the house and making sure that the right people are sitting in the right seats on the bus before you decide you're gonna go walk down this journey. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, the story I'll throw out there. It's, it's similar, I think it sees the same data that Dan does, just a little different interpretation at the end. Uh, and I think it is done partly out of fear and anxiety, but it's a preemptive move to occupy the nationalist high ground before that's being used to potentially undermine. And this draws on Deng's experience in 78. So I'm happy in the Q&A to sort of get into the details of this. Uh, all the presenters to be on the, uh, the seat, and then uh, we have a few minutes, but just a few minutes, uh, so uh, to, uh, to collect a few questions, uh, quick question, please, and then also it should be a question. Um, and uh, um, so, and then uh, I will collect the questions and then ask them to answer, uh, answer them. So uh, any, anyone who has a question? Okay, Liz. Uh, I really, I really liked all of everybody's presentations. They were really great. Um, where does the U.S. come into all of this now? We're looking at the focus on the politics of China and and, and Japan as well. But uh, then I thought this, um, your cartoon. Uh, showed it all. I mean, the fact that still the United States is is really figuratively or literally in the middle. Uh, what what does what are the implications for our foreign policy? Okay. Uh, now I ask the presenters, panelists, to uh, then conclude the panel. So uh, uh, each person uh, gives a brief comment to um, um, to answer those questions. Uh, I'll think on the fly here. Um, in terms of the, the economic side, I'll, I'll leave it more to the econ experts, but you know, my, my sense of the issue of uh, Chinese holdings of American debt is, you know, if I owe you 10 bucks, you've got a certain amount of leverage over me, but if I owe you a million bucks, uh, you're pretty powerless. And um, that's pretty much my sense of uh, economic interdependence in U.S.-China relations today. 
There is this popular view that somehow China has leverage over the United States because of the amount of money we owe them in terms of their purchase of T-bills. But I actually would be rather in, in the American position than to be a, a PRC citizen um, who has absolutely no control over the value of their dollar holdings. Um, you know, we make decisions about whether we want to value or devalue the dollar without consulting um, the owner of the most dollars. So we essentially determine the size of uh, the Chinese Treasury. Um, so I'm not too concerned about that. I think we're getting the better end of that stick. The, the bigger question about uh, foreign policy implications for the United States, um, I don't know what I can say in just a, a few words um, other than what I, I said before, which is we, we cannot stand back and pretend to just be a neutral third party. Um, Unfortunately, the, the reality is, is that China holds the United States accountable for all of these issues, um, from Taiwan to you know, problems with the Philippines to problems with Japan, because the underlying script is you know, without, China's, without America's backing, countries like the Philippines would not stand up to China. Even Japan, without America, without the U.S.-Japan alliance, Japan would not stand up to China. So it's America's fault. We are to blame. And therefore, we're in the middle of it. And that's why I included that last slide, is because there's a lot of anger between China and Japan, but we're the one that's going to end up driving our aircraft carrier into those rocks. Um, so we need to realize that as much as we would like to step back and play the neutral third party, uh, that's just not the reality of how the PRC sees it. Well, first I want to thank uh, my colleague, Professor Norris, here for really uh, coming up with uh, really, I mean, I think we both agree that it's not hubris which explains the shift to the, to the more assertive foreign policy, but he really added a lot of value by pointing out that uh, it could be part of a strategy to uh, consolidate uh, or at least create a climate in which it would be difficult to dissent from the uh, tough decisions that will have to be made to implement serious economic reform. And by the way, not only 1978 to 80 was this done, but also 1958, the beginning of the cultural, uh, beginning of the Great Leap Forward, Mao created a, a climate of international tension when he was going to pursue these very serious. That's really a really insightful idea, and I'm going to steal that idea, actually. No, no. <laughs> I'll give you credit for it. We, we could collaborate on it. You should steal that. from a junior <laughs> faculty member. That's not cool. <laughs> on, the, uh, on the economic question, uh, I, I agree with my colleague here, Professor Grease, about the... Uh, see, the thing is, China doesn't really owe us any money. China bought securities, bonds, with fixed dates of maturity. So it can't... It's not like it can't call in the loans, right? Those securities will mature at a certain date, and then China gets paid. In the meantime, it could sell those on the open market, and if it does that, it has to worry about the value of its currency relative to the dollar. So I don't worry about that too much. I do worry about Amer American companies like KFC, which actually the, the whole Yum family, <laughs> sounds kind of funny to say the whole Yum family, but I guess it's getting close to lunchtime. KFC in particular has been losing money for the last year in China because of a chicken scare. Because of uh, there were rumors circulated, possibly by China's own chicken restaurant people, that, that KFC was using chickens injected with steroids or something like that. And so Yum has been in trouble for the last year or so. But other consumer companies have done, it, it varies a lot by the, the field, right? Um, but, you know, if they do succeed in making a shift to more consumption, uh, consumption-led growth, that will ultimately be good for American and other foreign consumers because those foreign cons uh, consumer products are very popular in China since, unfortunately, a lot of Chinese manufactured consumer products are not, are not of such high quality. And then finally, on the, the really important question on American foreign policy, if I'm right, if Professor Norris is right, that it's not hubris but really fear, uh, and the need to create a kind of a climate in which reform can be pursued. And what needs to happen is that the United States, Japan, South Korea, and, uh, Philippines, and so on, really need to play it very cool over the next few years and be tough, but also do everything you can, be very smart to not let things break down, deteriorate, escalation set in, and a war break out, or even many wars break out that could create a really crisis-type atmosphere. Because if, if, this, if the Chinese economists 
all those Chinese economists I read from 2008 or so to 2013 are right, then five years from now, China is not really going to be in a position to be pushing these other countries around. It's going to look a lot weaker, and again, it will inspire a lot less awe than it does now. So we somehow need to hold the line very cleverly, and then actually help China make that transition. Because ultimately, a healthy, consumer-oriented China possibly making a transition ultimately to some more liberal political system would be actually good for Japan, the United States, and other countries in the region. Yeah, I would, uh, I would echo a lot of what's already been said. Um, on the debt ownership, I agree uh, with my other two panelists. I, I think the, um, the debt is really, you have to think about this in sort of macroeconomic terms. It's the residual when you hold your exchange rate fixed and have an export-oriented growth economy. The third part of that triangle, the third leg of that triangle has got to go somewhere, and it's going to go, it goes to your capital account. So you end up getting all of this American debt. There's no other asset class in the world that could effectively soak up that much liquidity. When you have that kind of uh, imbalance at this scale, U.S. government bonds is the only asset class that could possibly absorb that kind of demand without radically shooting up the price or down the interest rate, I guess. Um, so, so it is now that they've sort of woken up and discovered that they're in this pickle, uh, they're trying to diversify out. But in terms of exiting the position, it's not a liquid position for them. It's not easy for them to exit out of this. And whether or not it can do any leverage uh, I, I tend to agree with my colleagues. I just, it doesn't strike me as being a very easily uh, leveraged strategic weapon uh, in international affairs. Now, where it might help uh, is on recapitalization of getting rid of some of these bad loans that they've underwritten now after the big stimulus in 2009. Um, and there's a track record, again, for having done this, where you use some of these what ostensibly should be fiduciarily held capital accounts for domestic fiscal purposes. Eh, it's a little sketchy in terms of the economic uh, accounting at the, at the national level. But you know, China's not one to, to be, be beholden by norms of accounting, uh, certainly. So, so, so there's, uh, there's precedent for these kinds of operations. So you could possibly tap into some of this um, wealth to recapitalize and do some of your social welfare, uh, smoothing out of some of the inequality issues that was raised earlier. Um, so there's a way you could redeploy some of this money, but you're not going to be able to exit the position, and I think it'd be very difficult to use it in a strategic way. Um, in terms of uh, the investing in multinational companies over there, I think that there is an opportunity. I agree with, with my panelists. Um, but you've got to be smart on how you enter into the China market. You have to partner with uh, players who share the proper incentive structure. Chinese business people are very good, and they will respond rationally to the proper incentives. So if you're in a situation where you make money if they make money, then you'll make money. If you're in a situation where they can make money if you lose money, you'll lose money. <laughs> so you have to line up the incentives appropriately if you're going to do international investments. Um, and I think that there is a big opportunity. It's a growing dynamic economy. And consumption is a huge potential market opportunity, a huge driver of that. Um, but you've got to do it in a smart way. Uh, in terms of US foreign policy, I think that this has the same sort of impact or implications for US foreign policy. The first thing the United States ought to do is recognize and correctly diagnose the dynamics that we're observing. What is driving this behavior? And then I think the prescriptions follow exactly on what both Dan and Peter suggest, which is you have to reassure, you have to be able to maintain a robust presence that prohibits adventurism and makes the cost of unilateral disturbances of the status quo exceedingly high. At the same time, I think it's a mistake to rest there and stop there. I think. Uh, Secretary Steinberg's um, notes yesterday and, and sort of his comments suggest that we're done. You know, we say that this is status quo, nobody change, we're done here. Uh, I'm not sure that we're totally done for the reasons I think that Peter does a nice job laying out. We're in it. I mean, whether you like it or not. So you better be in it in a smart way, and you better think things through. And I think uh, Josh Rovner's question yesterday, uh, I think, raised some of these inconsistencies in the potential U.S. strategy. I'm not sure we thought it through all the way. If I'm right, I mean, if this actually is going to go towards an economic reform movement, then one of the big things the U.S. could do in a positive sense is to encourage that, to be an open player that's going to uh, embrace and help support that kind of a major movement. And there's, you know, there's more nuanced ways we can do that. But I think big picture-wise, that's a generally speaking a good thing. I think if you can help liberalize China's economy, I think you're going to, you're going to achieve strategic objectives for the United States and the U.S. foreign interest. Okay, now I would li before lunch, I would like to introduce uh, the last speaker of the morning session, uh, my colleague, Professor Diana Newton. Um, 
I think you can see, and many of you know Diana, and then uh, you can see her uh, bio from the uh, the booklet. So uh, just I would like to um, I would like you to join me for welcoming Professor Diana Newton. Um, thank you so much. So my job was supposed to be to provide closing remarks, maybe sum up what everyone has said, um, but be because of our shortness on time and the fact that I'm hungry, and I'm sure many of you are, um, I'm going to assume you all were paying attention this morning and listening to what they were saying. Um, I just want to start by saying it was a really a fascinating set of presentations. Um, I think both the historical panel and the political panel um, touched on some very, very important themes. And, um, and I just want to thank everyone for their well-researched uh, remarks. Um, I think a couple of things that I just briefly want to mention is that Admiral Walsh sort of started us out um, with a lot of good thoughts that have been echoed throughout the conference. But um, one of the things that he really did was he um, was the first to raise some of the recurrent themes today, um, one being that these situations have a tendency to escalate very rapidly, and that that is a big part of the dynamic. Another theme um, was that minor issues become major very quickly. Mountains get made out of molehills, and people think, oh, this is small. It's What's the risk? It's not a problem. And suddenly, it is a big problem, and it's multinational. Um, and thirdly, um, really, that nationalism is playing such an important role um, in terms of each of the players, not just their notions of nationalism, sovereignty, their own political dynamics, but, you know, really, we're all interacting with each other in a global way that, that I think is somewhat new in terms of technology, ability to see what's going on in other countries right away, real-time images of protests and things. Um, and it's the United States as much as it's Japan and China and the other Southeast Asian nations. Um, I want to also um, talk about the um, historians. And I think um, from what we learned about uh, the, from the historical panel, um, in fact, none of this is new. And that, you know, I think in some ways we, we take comfort in that. Um, in some ways it makes us nervous because um, maybe while uh, no actual war has escalated because of these territorial disputes in Asia, we've had plenty of examples in our worldwide history of wars escalating over minor territorial disputes. So, um, but I think the, the fact that the territorial tensions rest on arguments of sovereignty, projection of power for audiences at home and ab abroad, diplomacy, customary usage, ancient maps that may have been drawn with completely different intentions but are being used today for different reasons. Um, and the tensions themselves have waxed and waned as nations became preoccupied with various other domestic issues or international ones, um, or as the accessibility to the resources has changed, technology has changed, um, as the abundance of what is actually there to be had has changed, um, and as um, Technologies have advanced to make unreachable resources now reachable. Um, if I move very quickly to the um, political panel, I think you know Professor Takeuchi really kicked it off nicely by raising his three comments um, and setting the stage. And then the panelists all did such a nice job, equally, of echoing that. Um, you know that China's biggest threat is China. The global community needs to worry about. Um, China's weakness and what China plans to do as an you know international stakeholder will it be responsible or not, and and I think um, that this discussion that all three of them really focused on um, a lot of the um, sovereignty and nationalism issues and how that plays out um, and how it will play out and how the United States needs to react to that is very very important. And as a former policymaker, I guess my question would be, how do we use all of this great information to make more effective policy along the lines of one of our questions? Um, the United States has said it doesn't have an opinion about who owns the territories. It wants a negotiated resolution, no conflict, peaceful. Uh, resolution, or at least a tacit agreement to disagree. I think it's somewhat what we heard from Jim Steinberg last night, that just stay put, everybody, don't move, freeze. Um, and that's maybe not that realistic. Um, but what, so what is the right path for U.S. policymakers? Um, do we ratify UNCLOS so we can advocate from within instead of trying to get China to adhere to a treaty that it, it has signed but we have not? Um, do we push for some rules of engagement for incidents at sea or some kind of information sharing or negotiating entity? Um, the problem with that, of course, is that no one wants to sit at the table, um, except for us, maybe. Um, and China definitely doesn't want us at the table. Um, and that relates you know, to the importance of the sovereignty and the nationalism and the desire not to appear weak domestically and how that's driving um, this complicated set of issues. Um, 
it's come up a lot. Josh asked it last night. Um, others have touched on it today. Should the U.S. continue to clarify its intentions, or does that just make things worse? Um, you know, Secretary Steinberg shared with us that a more credible commitment gives Japan more room to maneuver. Um, if Japan feels insecure, it will then start lashing out in ways. I mean, I think Will sort of said the domestic political reactions in Japan are understandable and somewhat under control, whereas Peter's reflection on what's happening in China suggests it's a little bit more out of control. Um, and, you know, but will it always be in control in Japan? And can we rely on that? And is that a good, good way to make policy? Um, it seems to me um, that in a lot of ways this discussion sounds or echoes in my mind of discussions about the Middle East peace process. Um, not to close on an incredibly pessimistic note, but um, the competing claims for the same dirt, this idea that no one party is right, no one party is wrong. They've all been there. They've all used the land. They've, they've fished around it. They've driven flags up flagpoles, um, used it for, for sanctuary at different times. And um, that there's no way, really, to kind of come out with a clear, divided plan um, to say, OK, you can have this and we can have that. Um, I think, though, that some of the reflections that we actually um, did not go to war in the past over this is helpful, and that maybe we can find some, some um, favorable outcomes in that. And that also, perhaps, the idea that um, using these, I, you, figuring out what is really at stake here. Is it the oil and gas? And if it's the oil and gas, then can't those things be um, sought out jointly and in consortia? And they have been in other parts of the Pacific. And so certainly, um, that's one option. But I think really the most interesting and telling is what is going on in China today and how that will play out over the next few years. And I think that is where, um, to echo our panelists, where the United States policymakers should go. Because I think that is where they have the most ability to shape this in a positive way and have some control over the situation, which the nationalism and the um, dramatic tendencies of the nations involved and their own individual feelings of absolute sovereignty um, are much more out of our control as policymakers. So thank you very much.